opportunities, new challenges that lie before us, new things that we can get involved with, we can invest ourselves in. It's kind of like the, the seasons of, of agriculture that we invest, we put ourselves into planting new things. During the summer is the time of growth, of going deeper, of setting those roots, hitting that, those nu nutrients, the, that hidden water, that source of life that helps us grow. In the fall, we talk about stewardship. We talk about using those gifts. What gifts has God put into you to help you flourish and to help you move on? If you've ever felt yourself at odds or out of control or perhaps in a rut or routine, just kind of going through the motions of life, it's usually because you've lost your story. Why am I here? What are we doing? Why do we go through these, these rituals that we go through? And, I, and on a Sunday morning as we gather, we take time out of our busy schedule really to recenter ourselves. The idea is, is that on a Sunday morning as we gather, we think through the, the events of the week and we say, is this really who I am? Is this who I want to be? Because if you don't know your story, if you don't know who you are, as Carl Jung, the psychologist, once said, if, if you don't know who you are, the world's gonna ask you just once who you are, and if you don't know, the world's gonna tell you who you are. So the question that lies before us today is, what story are you living? Is it your own? Is it who you want to be? Or is it somebody else's expectations of who you ought to be? Throughout history, the church has centered on the Apostles' Creed as its story. This is who we are. This is why we do what we do. If you look in your sermon notes, which you'll find in your bulletin, you will find that the reason that it's called the Apostles' Creed is it's broken down, ideally, into 12 stanzas, 12 for the apostles, each having an idea or a thought or a philosophy about why we do what we do. The idea was is that sometimes in the busyness of our lives, we can lose track of who we are. We can lose who we are by going through the busyness and the motions, the activities. We can be so consumed by becoming that we forget who we're becoming. The creed was a way for us to center our lives on what that means. And so for this next couple of weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to say, this I believe? This is who I am. And for the early church, the idea was is that this was a sermon in miniature. This is who you are, this is what we believe. So let's begin by taking a look at the creed as it was articulated in the first century. And if you wanna share along, I would encourage you to just join with me as we read together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father, may our hearts be united as one as we share together our story, your story, who we are, and especially who we can become. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you look at the creed, how it's broken down into the 12 stanzas, which we're not gonna go through it line by line by line. Some people do that to talk about, you know, in the, in the creed it talks about was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That is essential to the theology of the virgin birth, of the purity of Christ, the initiation of the Holy Spirit of God on that. We're not gonna go through it line by line, but we're gonna look at it in chunks as the way it's kind of broken down. And if you look at it, it it's broken down into three main chunks. First of all, it's the identifying who God is, right? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
that idea of the Father, the essential authority and sovereignty of God above. When we say, I believe, it's essentially saying, I believe in the authority of God. I, I believe that life has a story, that there's something that is playing out that is even bigger than who you are, even bigger than your own life. There's something that is playing out in our time, but also in the cosmos. And so we talked about that early statement, I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the tenderness of the Father, the sovereignty and the power of the Almighty, but the creative and the personal purposefulness of the creator God. You have a purpose. When you say at the beginning, this is what I believe, you're telling us something about the direction of your life. Now the problem is, is that in our own generation, we often use that word differently. You might say, for example, I believe that the Mountaineers are going to win the championship this year. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. Faith, faith springs eternal. <laughs> but when you say, this is what I believe, basically you're saying, I think the odds are in my favor. Right? I believe we're going to have a good day today. The odds are in our favor. When the early church said, I believe, it says, this is who I am. It's a statement about your values, not about the odds or the probability, but about the purposefulness and the commitment. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe that there's something bigger. And in our own generation, that statement has been somehow undermined by what Timothy Keller would say, counterfeit gods. What are the counterfeit gods that are constantly playing on your mind and on your heart? Believe it or not, one of the most powerful gods that is playing on your own time is time. Your dedication of your time. Your time is valuable. Your time, do I give my time to this or to this? There's sometimes I don't have the time to do that. We often think that the most powerful god in our lives is money, but now for us in our generation and in our culture, time is becoming a bigger issue. So that on a Sunday morning in the middle of summer, when there aren't that many people, it's because the God of time is playing on our hearts and minds. What are those false gods that often play on our lives? For the early church, it recognized that sometimes we can get off track. We can lose our way. We can forget who we are. And so they created a creed to constant remind us to have that memorized, I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe, and that's who we are. But what does it mean when you say something like, I believe in Jesus Christ? The creed begins by talking about the sovereignty of God, but if you look at it, the bulk of the creed talks about the life and the story of Jesus Christ, he was, right, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The story, the narrative of who Jesus is was so much important to the early church, we have to grind that into us. Sometimes we can lose our way by not recognizing what the story of Jesus is trying to communicate to us. So instead of taking it line by line, let's look at the bigger picture of who Jesus is, what the story is. Before we get to the last section, which is talks about spiritual formation. I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's all it says about the Holy Spirit. In the nature of the Trinity, that's all we give to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the spiritual formation comes at the end. The life of Jesus fills the bulk of the creed because that's what we need to remember. So what's it telling us about who we are? I wanted to begin with a, just a wonderful quote that I think really speaks a lot. It, it's, it was, it's by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And Dostoevsky once said, it is not as a child that I believe and confess Jesus Christ. My hosannas are born of a furnace of doubt. It is in the struggle of life. It is in the doubts and the uncertainty. It's in the pain and the anguish that I understand who Jesus is, that I wrestle with what is Jesus doing in my life? What is God all about? It, not just in Sunday morning here in the pews, but 
in the workplace, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in my emotional life? What does it mean to be Jesus the Christ? You recognize that Christ is a Greek word, meaning Christos, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one. So that when we say, I believe, I believe in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Lord, what is it that we're really saying? There's a couple of things I think that we need to draw our attention to. The first one is, is I believe that it's telling us there's a wild twist in a very depressing story. The Old Testament story kind of ends by saying, here are the Ten Commandments. Keep them perfectly, and you will find peace with God. And so we struggle with sacrifices. We, there's all a part of us, a feeling of inadequacy in all of us. Our children are raised in an environment of competition and measuring up. We live that life. How do I measure up? The Bible answers that with, by sacrifices, by going to the temple, by recognizing the difference between you and God. And into that story, into that sovereignty of God, the, the glory and the majesty of God comes Jesus Christ. And we recognize that God is doing something different in the world. We recognize the difference and recognize that what we could not do for ourselves, God reached out in order to embrace us. In the, in the furnace of doubt and anguish, God came to you. I believe that God is still coming to you. I believe today is that time when God is reaching out to you. I believe you are here not by your choice, but by the drawing of God. You, you felt moved this morning. Maybe you got up and you said, I should go. There was a stirring. I, I should. Why should you? What are you looking for? Who are you looking for? What voice are you hearing? The creed tells us that in the beginning, God created all of us with a, a spark of the divine, and somehow we have heard from other gods, other stories, but there's a new story, and I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord. I believe he's calling to you, drawing you out, but in that story of our lives, we recognize that God is doing a new thing. It is a wild twist on that old story. No longer is God distant and, and, of, and distant from us and at a, something that we have to try and push through. God said, I wanna come to you. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. When we see Jesus, we see the tenderness of who God is. When we see the woman at the well, and we hear Jesus interact, we see God reaching out. When we hear Jesus tell the parable of the prodigal son, we hear Jesus telling his own story of the father's longing for a relationship with us. In the Old Testament, whenever anybody encountered God, whether it was in a vision, it was always with terror and this expression of I'm becoming undone. Moses said, if I could only see you God face to face, then I would know. And God said, you, you can't see me face to face. You'd be destroyed by my holiness. But when we see Jesus, we see God bridging that gap. It is a wild twist on a very old story. God is doing something new. Jesus said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I also believe in crazy love of God. Most of you have love in your life. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child. How many of you love your children? Oh good, a couple of you raised your hands. For those of you that have 
kids and they, they didn't raise their hand, you ought to look around. That kind of love, as profound as it is, pales in comparison. The Bible wants us to know that God came to those that were, that were rejecting him. And he said, I was willing to die. In the, in the creed, it's a constant reminder. He came unto, the, he was born of the Virgin Mary and he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He suffered at the hands of those that he came to save. What kind of love is this? It's that sense of an awakening within us of saying, you came into my life to save me, to suffer at the hands of Pilate? This past Lent, we went through a study, the case for Christ, and we talked about what it means to go through a crucifixion. We talked about what it meant to go through scourging at the hands of the Romans. And we recognize that he did that for you. That's a crazy kind of love. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, greater love has no one than he lay down his life for one's friends. I believe that Jesus came to save people like me with a love that I cannot even yet begin to comprehend. And sometimes we, go, we gloss right over it. We just kind of go through the motions of our church and say, why would he do something like that for me? We always have this sense of inadequacy about us, and yet God said, I want you that much. We think of God as being distant, and yet even today, Jesus is here with us, saying, I have brought you to this place so that you could experience me again. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of all. I believe that he came to create a wild change in an old and depressing story. I believe that he came in order to show you the crazy kind of love that God has for you. And I also believe because of the radical hope for my darkest days. Most people go through difficult times in their lives whether it's circumstances that are out of their control, whether it's a hospital visit, whether it's a biopsy that didn't go the way they wanted it to go. Maybe it's a relationship that fell apart. Maybe it's a job that moved somewhere else. And in that darkest of moment, it tells us that Jesus went through that and yet he came out on the other side. He suffered at the hands of Pontius Pilate. He was crucified and he died. But on the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. In the darkest moments of our lives, we recognize that Jesus understands and is giving us a path out of it. We recognize in Psalm 23, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear nothing. Why? because I know you are with me. That confidence, that power, that strength, that in the darkest of moments, you have that hope. I want you to just think about your friends, people that maybe you are in the back of your mind that, that really don't have a relationship with Christ, that go through dark moments. Who do they have to guide them through? Where will they turn? They are listening to another story, another creed, if you will, Paul said this in Romans chapter eight. He said, I am convinced now that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, height nor depth nor anything in creation can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe that in the darkest moments, Christ will be there. We need to be reminded of this over and over again. I need to be reminded, I believe in Jesus Christ. And then it ends with a very, very curious statement about what I believe. The very last sentence of that stanza. I believe he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and guess what? He will come again to judge the quick and the dead because I believe our choices matter. 
Now that you know that God has reached out to you this morning, he is extending the olive branch. I believe in Christ Jesus. I believe his love goes beyond anything that you can conceive or imagine. I believe that that means there's hope, not just for this life, but for the life to come. How will we choose? What will we choose? You will make your choices, and then your choices make you. Somebody once said that death is simply like a taxi. It will take you exactly where you want to go. What choices are you making? Maybe it's time to change some of that. Maybe it's time to be awakened to the possibilities of new life. If you have that understanding that God is doing something new, inviting you to be a part of it, are you a part of it? Are you a part of the story? Are you merely watching from the outside? Remember, Dostoevsky said, it is not as a child that I make my confessions, but as a furnace of doubt. It's in the struggle, it's in the uncertainty, it's in the deeper things of life that I go deeper and I set my roots. That's where I learn. And so when it comes to your choices, and the choices matter, do you interact with God as a child would? Think about this as a child, as a child with a parent. The parent is the authority. The, ch the parent says, do this, and in theory, the child will respond, right? That's the theory, right? The child does what it's told. It doesn't know why, it just responds. It goes through the motions. As they go older, as you reach the adolescence, the parents begin to loosen the reins a little bit. The child wants to spread its wings a little bit, but the parent needs to watch over and guide and make sure that that child doesn't go off at the deep end because the parent has a deeper vision of what's possible. And of course, then as they grow older, as they get to be an adult, the parents begin to fade into the background and the parents become more of a friend than just an authority. The question is, is where is, you, where is your walk with God in the creed? Are you as a child, you just do what you're told, you go through the motions, hoping that it'll all work out, or are you digging deeper and experiencing fullness that God has in store for you? Are you kind of cautious? Maybe you're kind of like, I don't know that I wanna get my feet wet, I like watching other people, but I'm really on the outside. There's so much more that God has in store for you. And then of course the question is, is, are you committed to it? So here are the things that I would wanna ask. Where are you accountable to others? Where are you growing in your faith? How are you accountable to others in your study and in the depth of knowledge of who you are? Tell me about where you're sacrificing. Tell me about the sacrifice of your time and your treasure and your talents. Tell me where you're investing yourself because this is who you are. This is what you believe. And tell me where your joy is. Tell me where you're able to give yourself to somebody else, whether you're able to sing up here with the praise team, you're able to use your talents where that joy flows through you, and you're able to light people up because God is using you in a way you never imagined possible. In Ephesians chapter four, Paul writes, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. We will become many Jesuses in our world. We will reach down and lift people up. We will see what other people don't see. We will heal what other people only thought was broken. We will go where nobody expected. As a church, that's our creed, that's who we are. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord. So the question then becomes, what you believe you will become. The creed reminds us of the journey that we're on. Who are we becoming? What path have we set before us? I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. That's the path that we're on. That's the commitment. So that when you get up and you have to make a decision between what you're gonna do today or 
whether you're gonna do that shady deal that you're kind of worried about, whether you think people will find out about it or not, or whether you'll ignore that problem or this problem, in the back of your mind, there's a little voice that says, but I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord. That's who I am. That's the journey that I'm on. That's the power of having a creed. If you don't have a creed that you believe in, you're at the mercy of good marketing and good commercials. And when you think about the people that you live around, how many are guided simply by the marketing that they see on TV, driven in a consumer world? The creed said, we as a people, this is what we believe. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the people that are drawn out of a busy and a hectic life to experience you anew, to draw the strength that they gain from their fellowship, to challenge one another, to celebrate our milestones, but also to share joyfully what we have. Sometimes it's sad to think of all of those that do not know this joy or that pass by this joy without even giving it a second thought. Help us, Father, to believe, to follow through, and to become the people you know that we are. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.